So let's just take a few things here. By the way, there's a book for each of you, families, and uh, a CD back there that uh, is designed to make you cry. Not because the music's so bad, the music's good. It's because they're love songs to Jesus that will hopefully put words to the passions you'd like to say, but you're fumbling for words. So be careful. You might not want to drive while you're listening to it. Adam was driven from the garden, and then he was pronounced, uh, a curse was pronounced over him. He would till the ground among thorns and thistles and sweat of his brow. Now that is very different. It's got to be very distinctly different from his activity in the garden. We do know that in the garden, he tended the garden. That's biblical language. But that cannot be equated with tilling the ground among thorns and thistles by the sweat of your brow. So whatever he did in the garden, whatever tending means, which we don't know too much, except for he named the animals. That's about all we know. That sounds like fun stuff to me. But whatever that was, this was contrastly, contrasted uh, from you know, 180 degrees. And that has become the status quo, the gold standard for the way we make money nowadays. Uh, the cool thing is that in, in judgment, God says, I'm going to make mercy triumph over judgment. I'm, I'm always going to make a way for you to make it, to somehow escape the judgment. I'm going to give you a way. So he says, if you work hard for 40 hours a week, till the ground or whatever you do, I'll put beans on the table and you can feed the people, feed your family. So even atheists, even those who are rebellious to God, God says, if you use my principles, they work. Isn't that big heart of, of him? He, gives, he lets his, his principles work, even if you don't like him. Isn't that amazing? God's just an amazing God. So here we are tilling the ground, and we've learned that in culture. Uh, we're 6,000 years past that time when it was pronounced upon Adam, and we still practice it. We preach it out in the church. I'm sorry, out in the world, and we even preach it in the church. But let's just take, for instance, for a moment, what happened with Jesus at the cross. So here's Jesus. He comes on the cross. We know that he took on the curse and became the curse so that you and I don't have to suffer the consequences of our own sin. Is that correct? Okay. So the Bible says the wages of sin is death, and Jesus took the wages of sin, which is death, upon himself. He died on the cross. And thank you, Jesus. Awesome. Now, that was a big deal for him, and for us, it's kind of a position of faith. It's our theology. Uh, we quote it, and, but, you know, it's kind of ethereal. You can't, like, get a hold of it. It's like, right there it is. You know, let me measure it. Let me, you know, quantify it, and, uh, you know, let me show it to you, and I don't mean, like, show you in a word. You can't just hold something up, like pictures in that book I'm sitting around. You can't really do that. It's kind of ethereal stuff. Well, let me ask you the question. When Jesus came to earth and took on the curse, did he take on just part of the curse or all of the curse? You might know I'm going to push you a little bit, squeeze you in a corner with this. I think he took on all the curse, not just the wages of sin, which are the consequences of, of our sin, the curse, but I think he took on all of the curse. In fact, remember till the ground among thorns and thistles by the sweat of your brow. Remember that? What did Jesus wear on his head, on his brow? A crown of thorns. I wonder if, perchance, outside chance, if that's symbolic, has any relevance. Have any relevance at all? That was 2,000 years ago, guys, and we're still largely living under the same curse that Adam did. We still do the same thing. We've not appropriated the breakthrough, the freedom that was given to us, afforded to us by Jesus. Huh. And there we go. We just keep going through life and just kind of, uh, just kind of doing our, our thing. So you say, well, Mark, I don't know. Can you give me some examples of how we could recapture, how we could reclaim something that's in the Bible, but, you know, we haven't seen it in our lives. Okay, since you ask. Uh, in the 1900s, we saw four or five major revelations 
come to pass, come to be revealed, and then become fairly commonplace in the body of Christ. One of them is, in the early 1900s, we saw the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We got uh, Azusa, we've got Wichita, Topeka, we've got Wales, and several other places that baptism of the Holy Spirit was uh, emerged and became uh, expressed on the earth largely through some individuals who were desperate to find a breakthrough in God. I read a biography about Frank Bartleman. He was so gripped, and he was from Azusa Street, and before Azusa broke out, he was so gripped, he'd go to this group and that group, and he says, I don't see it anywhere, what I'm seeing in here, and I want it. And he began to fast, and his wife says, if you don't stop fasting, you're going to die. He says, I'll die if I don't. How bad do you want the things that are in here? How much does your heart hunger for it? Do you burn for it? Is your heart like Jesus uh, 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 consume with zeal for your father's house? I don't mean for these four walls. I'm talking for the truth, the heart of what he wants to release in the earth. Does your heart grip for it? Are you willing to pay the price not only for yourself, but for your friends, for your family, for your society? Well, a few people did with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and nowadays we see it fairly common. Even if they don't believe it, they got a lot of tolerance for it in other churches. And then we saw salvation. In the early 1900s and previous, we didn't have the assurance for salvation. We thought it was possible, but we weren't guaranteed. So we came up to mourner's benches, and we cried out maybe two weeks in a row, scream, wailed, and whatever, to get a breakthrough. We wanted to break through. That was kind of a key word, breakthrough. And so maybe perchance we could get saved. But unfortunately, in those days, we were not sure but what we could lose that salvation in the next week and have to repeat the process. But now we're really confident that we can have the assurance of salvation. Believe in your heart, confess through your mouth, believe in your heart, and thou shalt be saved. That's pretty simple, guys. Somebody start believing that, start, start proclaiming to us. And it's, okay, we're buying in. The word of God is true. It's truer than my feelings. See how we're doing it? We're having to come to terms with, is this true or is it not? And it is true. How about, how about healing? In the early 1900s up to mid-1900s, they're tent meeting revivalists. And if you wanted to be healed, you had to go to a faith healer. And a lot of healings happen. Jack Coe, Ailey Allen, uh, T.L. Osborne, uh, Oral Roberts, uh, William Branham, you know, and, uh, and just a, a ton of guys. And my father was, of course, uh, a contemporary, and he went to see most of those guys, as did Debbie's father. So they created a great heritage for us, a launching pad. But the truth is, a long time ago, a guy in the 80s by the name of John Wimber and said, when do we get to do this stuff? Why is it only relegated to a few faith guys, big guys, big dogs? He said, I want to do this stuff. He says, I prayed for 1,000 people before I got my first healing. How's that working for you? Something stirring, like, God, I'm going after this stuff. How about prophetic? See, back in, I remember in the late 50s, early 60s, uh, Debbie, my preaching is not that bad. <laughs> this is her second time, and, well, probably about her hundredth or thousandth time. But anyway, she's a good woman. I love her. And uh, so the prophetic, you know, uh, if you wanted to be prophesied over, you had to go to prophetic people, such as William Branham. And along come the prophetic movement and movements in the 80s. And we started be beginning to believe 1 Corinthians 14, which says you can all prophesy. And now we pretty much, I imagine most of you have, have stepped into that and given prophetic words. And Pat and others, or you're raising up prophetic teams. Awesome, awesome, awesome. It's a truth that was in the Bible since Jesus' day. Of course, it was there in the heart of God forever. And the truth is, any individual could get anything in God's heart, regardless of timing, if they wanted to go after it. But the cool thing is, when it's a corporate or global timing, it gets poured out on all of humanity, maybe by a few who pay the price, but it's God's epic timing. Guess what? It's like a wave to a surfer. Now I don't have to work so hard. I catch the wave, and whoa, this is so much more easy. 
because you're on this epic or this global outpouring of grace that God's doing in the earth. I think that's the case. God is restoring to us revelations that have been hidden, even though they've been in plain sight in front of us. But they've been hidden from us. Some, nobody declared them to us. How shall the people know unless the preacher preaches? You know, the trumpet makes a clear sound. How shall we know? Well, God is revealing it to a few to clarion call over the many. And we're beginning to believe it. Is that cool? I think God is doing that for me. He's helping me to find a position of faith it's worked in our lives. Debbie and I have not had outstanding debt except for mortgage for about 15 years. We've not had credit card debt, car debt, any kind of debt, personal debt of any kind. We pay off our credit card every, week, every month. And so no debt of any kind except for mortgage for 15, for 15 years until this year. In February, somebody emailed me and said, uh, Mark, how much do you owe on your mortgage? I think it's a paid down to about 11200 He says, cool. He says, I want to pay that off so you don't have to think about your mortgage anymore. Guess what? I'm debt-free completely. <laughs> is that cool? The cool thing is I never go out and ask for money. I never talk about money. I don't take out offerings. We give away all of our product. This cost me $5 a book. Our CDs cost roughly... 60 cents, something like that. Uh, and so we give it all away. We give away all of our... Oh, they're, they're still looking at us. <laughs> we give away all of our product, all of our time. We travel around the world, almost never talk about money anywhere we go unless they bring it up. The cool thing is, like, for instance, here's my book. I gave some church out, and I never met this guy, a pastor out in uh, Virginia. Uh, he called me up. He says, Mark, I want this book. I read it, and it's revolutionary. I want to give it to my whole church. Can you send me a box? I said, sure. How much it cost? I said, well, pay the postage. 20 bucks to send a box of 50 or something like that. I sent it to him. I never thought a thing about it. I don't care anymore. I just really don't care. You cannot outgive God. You can't. I know that preaches well, but it experiences well. It's real. It really happens. Well, the thing went on and on and on, maybe a year or two later, and the guy called me up and says, Call me. I got something to tell you. We've had a major windfall breakthrough in our church for a corporate church and many people in the church. He says, I want to send you $1,000. He did. Awesome. Well, that way more than paid for the books. Guess what? See, God just wanted to get me freed up in the mind. So I don't think, okay, I did A plus B equals C. You get the books, but you got to pay me. And so he says, oh, that sounds kind of tough. And by the way, how could you ever sell this book? That'd be the dumbest thing ever. I'm going to tell you about supernatural provision. Pay me $16.95. How could you sell the heart of God? How could you sell a gift that's given to you, especially with that title? And so the cool thing is, you just can't outgive God. God comes, back, comes through so wildly. I was telling the first group, so when I had to buy the last thousand books of a $5,000 contract on my first contract with these books, with the publisher, and so it's about $5,000, and we didn't have the money, and I had to fulfill my contract. Well, yeah, so, so 5,000 books, $5 a book is 25,000, you know? It's like, uh, that's a fun story, but I'm trying to cut it a little short here. And so we're up to needing another $5,000, and I said, we don't have that. And somewhere along the line, we have a direct bank deposit in our bank, of course, and I said, what is that? $5,200. Now, Debbie, woman of faith that she is, she's, oh, well, that's God's way to provide for the books. Great, you know, and I'm saying, ah, we just don't get that kind of deposit in our bank, you know, let me check that out, and I checked it out. It was from a royalty distribution company. I said, wait a minute, we don't get royalties like that. And so I looked it up, and it was a secular band. I think it was a rock band. And they had two songs, and it had the titles of the songs. I'd never heard the band or the songs. And I said, oh, Debbie, that, that money's not ours. I said, you've got to give it back. But we kept it in our bank because we didn't know where to send it. We didn't, pay, we didn't uh, spend it. She sent an email and sent a phone call, and no answer. A couple months later, now we really need books because people are asking for them. We get an email from the manager of the distribution part of this company. He says, yeah, I'm the manager. Ah, uh, yeah, it's right. You brought the to our attention. We made a mistake, and 
Miss Page, you, and uh, glad you brought it up. People don't normally tell us when we pay them wrongly, but he says, we don't have a way to receive back erroneously paid monies. So no further response necessary on your part. How do you do business like that? <laughs> so that's pretty good, right? We can stop there, right? That's good enough to tell that story. But it gets better. Second paragraph says, but furthermore, we've passed the fourth quarter pay period, and in two weeks or three weeks, there'll be another 600 and some dollars come to you. And again, no further response necessary. I would have just put a stop payment on that thing, you know? <laughs> What's wrong with you, you know? But of course, I didn't say that to him because I just love the ingenious of God. He is so cool that he helps make provision, listen to this, outside of the sweat zone. Remember, that was the curse. We didn't sweat for this. So this gets, these stories get so cool. Like, that was one of my cooler stories. And by the way, at the end of every chapter, we have testimonies. And then I have a whole chapter of testimonies. And so just this week, or actually, yeah, this, this past week. So we got a check in the mail from a foundation that handles distribution of estates and trusts and different things like that. In the 90s, we lived in Wisconsin. We had invested in church about an hour away. And many times, we'd served in that church and done ministry. And to my knowledge, I don't know that they ever gave us an honorarium, but we'd never asked for any, and we never really thought about it. They might have given us pizza money once in a while. You know what that is, just enough to buy pizza to get home. And that's totally cool, many times. That was just all we have. And I said, well, Lord, uh, the Bible says with food and raiment, be there with content. We're happy campers. <laughs> By the way, that is your bottom line. I talk about that very seriously. Uh, would you pull up that uh, graphic with the little man climbing the mountain? Look at this. So the vertical line is our standard of living. The horizontal line at the bottom is our path in life, our progress in life. So this is a little man. We're climbing our attainments the things that we gain, giftings, skills, positions, relationships, anointings, whatever. By grace, we might come up to a certain line, but then there's something in maybe our humanness that's like, I want more. Now, I'm not talking about the godly wanting more. I'm talking about human aspirations, worldly goals. And so we continue to go on up the mountain, on up the mountain in our own strength. Do you know the Bible said in John 4, Jesus said, my food is to do the will of the Father. So anything up to that second horizontal line, he said, when you do that, it'll be food to you. In other words, I'll take over everything inside of that area. But when you go above that area, you get to do that all by yourself. You want a biblical example? Jonah. Uh-uh, I ain't going to Nineveh. I'm going down to Joppa. And I'm going to get myself a boat ticket. And the Bible says, and he paid for his own fare, quote verbatim. When you do your own thing, you get to pay for it. And when you say uncle, and by the way, that's by default when you got to, how about if you proactively like Jesus, whatever. When you do it his way, then he pays for the uh, oceanic fare. He's got special transportation. Perfectly suited to give you a little time to process. And you'll travel along and travel along, and he'll keep it going, keep you alive, sustain you, no problem. And then, boop, up on the shore, and you're off and running. <laughs> yes, sir, Jesus. Hopefully, your hearts are not resistant at that point. Below the line, he pays the fare. That's the takeaway phrase on this book on the back page it says, God's will is God's bill. Anything in his will. He pays. Anything in your will, you get to pay. Fun, fun, fun. Yeah? The one above requires sweat, working our fingers through the bone. Nervous, anxiety, stress, stewing, and whatever. The one below, you get to enter into rest. So somewhere along the line, we might come to a moment of reckoning. Okay, God, okay, okay, okay. I'm kind of tired of sweat. How do we get that reckoning? How do we come to that moment? Sometimes uh, we run into a brick wall. We had a young man living with us the last six months. 
kind of a renegade, kind of a maverick, and he got in trouble, and so he came and lived with us, and about two months into it, he hit another brick wall. Not for me, but I was there to help Jesus a little bit. <laughs> he had a come to Jesus moment in the absolute sense of the word. Gave his heart to the Lord, got saved, tears, bona fide, sincere, going for Jesus. And uh, sometimes we have the moment of reckoning. What is that? Relationship breakdown? Financial failure? Whatever. Hope not. It doesn't have to be. God doesn't want it that way. No way. That's not his first choice. First choice is he leads us with his eye, like, you know, over there. <laughs> and then it's whistle. <whistles> the Bible actually says in one case he whistles for his kids. The other one says he whispers, still small voice. Conscience. How loud does his voice have to be before we say, ah, okay. We don't need two befores, do we? No. No, no. Eh, wrong answer. Wrong answer. No two befores for this group. No, we're going after it proactively, which, by the way, this and really every other thing pertaining to and regarding God is we can either do it by default or proactively. In other words, yeah, yeah, you might be of sound mind and full strength right now, but one of these days, given normal course of life, you're probably not going to be as mobile as you have always been. Now, I don't think that's God's assignment. I just think that's kind of the commentary on humanity right at this stage of history. But somewhere we're probably not going to be as mobile and we can't work for a living. Guess what? By default, you're going to have to come back, God, you've got to support me. Why not be proactive? Why not do it on purpose? Why not, like some of you went to college, two, four, six, eight, ten, if you're a specialist in something, you might have gone eight or ten or twelve years because you wanted something. You wanted a degree, so the credentials that give you empowerment to walk out into something in life, some area in life. What if you did this, going after learning who the what the goodness of God is, the generosity of our Father, and the, your personal identity, and begin to learn how to hear his voice, which, by the way, you go to my website, my blog, and I got an, in an ironclad way, it works 100% for us, how to find the will of God. Got your interest? Well, then go there. Go to my business card back there. It's on that CD. And you type in fleece template in, on my blog, and it'll take you to it. It works all the time. We do all the great... Beyond the map blog right there, you type in fleece template, I'm telling you, it'll give you an ironclad way. You got to mean business with God, though. You got to get ruthless with yourself. You got you to shoot down those kind of spurious, warm, fuzzy thoughts. You got to get hard and down and dirty with your thinking. I don't mean dirty, but you get real serious about it. You got to go after it. And so I don't know where I was with all that. Oh, in the foundation story. Yes, see, it's a team effort here. And then, I've got to, and then I've got to wrap this up. And so uh, this week, after seven years of paying us maybe about $7,000, that stopped maybe eight or ten years ago. We haven't heard boo from them. Everything was completed as far as we're concerned. This week, we got a check for $6,200 from, uh, from that foundation. Like, I read the form letter. I still can't understand it. But you know what? It's got my name right there on the check. And this time, I'm going to receive it with gladness. <laughs> and so thank you, Jesus. So what I want to do is do one last thing. Do I, can I have some help here? Uh, James, you're an amazing guy. You might get some help. Pass one coin out to everybody. I'm going to talk a little bit about Matthew 17. It's, yeah, I think you got enough for, uh, I think there's enough for everybody in here. So... Uh, Matthew 17, and this is one of the chapters in my book. It's the, it's the story of Jesus and Peter going into the temple. Now, they go into the temple, and the temple guys say, well, Peter, does your master pay temple tax? Now, guys, don't get distracted with them, okay? They'll, kind of, they'll get around to you, all right? <laughs> Peter, does your master pay temple tax? Peter's like scratching his head. Uh, Jesus, do we pay temple tax? Uh, yes, we do, and that's a terrible system. Why should the fathers tax the son? That is so terrible. But nevertheless, today we're not going to bloody noses. So, uh, but 
Now listen, ask, uh, let me know if this is the correct version. Uh, but Peter, you know, we haven't got any money, and I forgot my checkbook. And they don't have ATMs where we live right now. So uh, why don't you go get an extra job? Uh, you know, we haven't worked for a while, but if you rally the guys and get all the boats and the nets and you go out fishing for a couple of nights, we'll have enough money and we can pay the temple taxes and then, hey, we'll splurge on Saturday night. We'll all go to movies. Does that sound like Jesus? That's not exactly the correct version? Okay, no, it's not. Well, it goes more like this. Peter, what have we been doing over the last year or so? Ah, Jesus, we've been out on the gospel trail. Just doing the ministry and doing stuff. And well, what are we doing? Oh, raising the dead and cleansing the leper and blind eyes seeing. Jesus says, you like that? Oh, man, it's so much better than fishing. Jesus says, yeah, we've been about our father's business. And you know what? Here's the cool thing. John later on is going to write it in John 4 that uh, our food is to do the will of the father. In other words, as we're doing the will of the father and just making his joy to be my joy, then guess what? He says, the Father will take care of all, remember below the, below the line? He'll take care of everything because God's will is God's will. So guess what? Today is not about getting an extra job. You got surprise taxes to pay, guys, at tax time? Peter didn't go. Jesus didn't say go get extra job. Jesus says enter into rest. Now today what I want you to do, Peter, is I want you to go home, get your rod and reel, and then on your way down to the lake, I want you to go by Starbucks and get a big iced coffee. And you're going to go down there, and I know you, Peter, you're, you're, you're going to try to make this thing work, but here's the deal. You're going to go fishing, and I want you to cast in a hook. Remember those words, because that's exactly what the Bible says. Now, I studied it. The money they owed was four days' wages. So when you cast in a hook, you are not going to make four days' wages with a hook. So Jesus telling Peter to fish was not going to get a vocation vocational paying job. That's not what it was about. It's about him, listen to this, going back to what he enjoyed as a child, where he had joy in living. Where he'd lost joy, his joy had become a job. And now he'd constrained others into it. Now it's a job for everybody. Let's just make a happy world out of this, you know? And Jesus is like, no. Let's go back to where you had joy, and I'm going to make a miracle where you used to have joy. So, Peter, you're going to lay there, and I want you to relax. I know you're going to watch that little bobber out there, and it ain't going down. You're going to run around here and here and there. Stop. This is about entering into rest today. At the end of the day, or somewhere along the line, you're going to catch a fish, and in that fish's mouth is going to be a gold coin. Peter's like, okay, Jesus, I got it. So he goes down and does his thing, and he's sitting there. He's tempted. Oh, that bobber is not going down. But Jesus told me to enter into rest, so... He leaned his head up against a log, and the gentle lapping of the waves, and pretty soon he falls asleep, sees the puffy clouds go by. Oh, you know what? I do love this life with Jesus. It's the best. He wakes up about that time, plunk, down goes the bobber, and Peter's reeling it in, and it's like, great, 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 this is awesome. He opens up, takes the hook out, and there's a coin in there. I've got to tell Jesus. Oh, that's right. He already knew about that. He quick, he throws that rod and reel down and he runs down to Jesus. Look at here, Jesus, you wouldn't believe. Well, I guess you would. And so Jesus says, yeah, it's how good our father is. When you and I find our pleasure at being a, about our father's pleasure, when we, our minds have been corralled, trained, begin to find joy at doing what brings him joy. This is not a sowing and reaping thing. This is just, uh, I just like being with you. I just want to be where you are, dwelling daily in your presence. Jesus said, yeah. When that gets worked good and deep, when that gets worked in there and infiltrated in where you're not always trying to exact something out. Well, I gave you something, you give me something, you know. And I, I, oh, that's hard life. When you start getting simple, like, a little child except you become like one of these little kids. You can't even get in the kingdom. So we become like a little child, and Peter's like, I think I'm getting it, Jesus. Yeah, he fell back a few more times later on, you know. I think he went down and plunked that, that gold coin in the coffers of the temple. There you go. 
And he took that fish home, and he and Mrs. Peter had the best fish dinner ever. And they live happily ever after. And what's the moral of that story? Careful, this almost break your break logic. Got extra pax, uh, taxes to pay? Take a vacation. Guys, we're not talking about couch potatoes, eating bonbons, and vegging out. It's not what we're talking about. Jobs can be good. There can be kingdom uh, dynamics in jobs that are very, very, very valuable. The Bible says, let a, young, let a man bear the burden in his youth. Probably means get a job so that you get some character. So that when you grow up, as you grow up, you have some character to put kingdom deposits in. You see? And so, what are you going to do in a job? Consistency, faithfulness, stewardship, discipleship. Either you discipling them or they're discipling you. Or enterprise creating something for other people to be discipled. And there could be a ton of reasons beyond income. The stress, stew, anxiety, stress, stress and stewing of, for, in, uh, for income. So find, find out what the Lord wants. Live below that second line. And watch him pay the bill. He'll do good for you. Take that, that coin out. It's a real live coin. Real live one. Breathing, moving. No, not really, but it has more power in it than you could possibly imagine. This was given to me about 10 years ago by a guy. I was studying Matthew 17, and a day later, then I was really like, yes, God, this is cool. You supply supernatural provision, you know, and that's been worked in our life for quite a long time, but I just have another installment. The next day I met this guy, and at the end of our conversation, we hadn't talked about finances at all. He reached in his pocket and pulled out two coins, two gold coins. This happens to be one of them. And he says, here, I think I'm supposed to give these to you. I said, that is amazing. It's because that's just what I studied about. I mean, I did research about it. And so I take this out. Every once in a while, Debbie says, well, we got some bills coming up. Am I going to get in lack or am I going to stay in abundance? Yeah? This coin is like, see the corner of this shirt right here? Like this is a shirt. It's a large. might be extra large. I'm not sure. But this coin is like the, just the corner of that shirt. Just, it's just the smallest representation of the huge promise of provision that God is giving to us. And so I take this coin, and I say, wow, Jesus, I'm out of my prayer trail. I, most of my prayer time, I like being out in a prayer trail. And I'm walking along. That's why you guys saw me pacing back there in the first service. I just like, oh, this is the best. You know, it activates, engages all of me, my whole being. And so I pull it out, and I say, Jesus, we got some bills down there in terra firma. You already knew about that before I did, didn't you? That is so cool. You know everything about my life, past, present, and future. And you are so full of faith. And so I'm just going to get in that faith, stay in that faith. So I pull it out and I do this like Jesus. That is such a big promise. I hold it out in front of me. Literally, I see it like a doorway. So sometimes I tend to like fall out of that doorway of faith, the room of faith, I tend to kind of fall out and get into this lack thing, you know. And so I hold it up. Literally, I do this as I'm walking along. I say, Jesus, today, I'm walking right back in. There I am, Jesus. Okay. Now, that means between now and whenever the answers manifest, I am not asking you for another thing regarding that issue because you've already finished it. So now what I want to do is get into rejoicing, into thanking, into appreciative, into the excitement of the journey. What kind of story is that going to be, God? I don't know what you're going to do, but it's going to be another good one. We're going to chalk it up. Look what Jesus did again. This is going to be, you've done that so many times. Has anybody had any great breakthroughs from God? Four of you. Okay. <laughs> Jesus, you're going to have to help them. <laughs> Obviously, every one of us. But if we're not careful, we can lose that slip over here. But do business with that gold coin. And by the way, that's not yours to give away. So I, I bought many of them, and I gave them away. And uh, that's why, by the way, this gold coin is on the front. I, get, I bought many of my own money. I gave them away, and I was out in church maybe two years ago, and I was giving away a bunch of them, and afterwards a guy came up to me and says, how could I donate to your ministry? 
I said, well, there's PayPal or there's a check or I don't know, there's several different ways. He says, cool. I'm going to give you $1,000 so you can buy another 1,000 coins so you can give it to another 1,000 people. How amazing is God? He says, I got a job for you to do, and I'm going to pay the bill. You just be happy. You just give them away. Just forget about you being the originator of anything in this. Just be happy about doing my stuff, and I'll take care of it. Below the line, right? God's will is God's will. Are you guys doing okay? Is your mind getting washed? The washing of the word. Now, part of it's the word of testimony, which you guys love testimony. Because why? Testimony gives the license and possibility for it to happen again in our lives. And part of what I've been sharing, of course, is the word. I haven't quoted too many references, but you've probably recognized many of the exact verbatim out of the word of God. And so with that, it's the washing of the word until my mind gets renewed, and thus I get transformed. Guys, I know that uh, your pastor has shared uh, over the last three or four weeks, whatever it was, the, the f- getting free in our minds from the ravages and the power of the curse, the effects of the curse. And guys, it's really true. And there's so much more I would love. I mean, this would just, I, I can't do this justice. It's just not even possible because it just requires First of all, some teaching, and second of all, it just enjoys, it just requires some uh, exuberance, getting ecstatic about it. Let me, let me tell you another story that proves that point, you know? And so uh, I hope you've gotten something out of it. Doing okay? If you don't mind, put your hands on your head. Uh, yeah, we'll do this first. Lord, I just bless my mind to have renewed thoughts. Renewed thoughts. Uh, and God, when, when my circumstances and my feelings uh, get into an illegal, uh, inappropriate place, I'm not talking about sin here. I'm talking about unbelief and doubt and fear and anxiety and stress and stew and all those bad words, Jesus. When my mind wants to go there, uh, Lord, I just charge my mind to send off some red uh, flags and sirens and klaxons and whistles and say, uh, 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 uh. It's illegal. You can't go there. Mind, I just charge you in Jesus' name. I'm going to begin taking every thought captive. And the ones that want to take me down, pull me into darkness and fear and unbelief, I just said, no more Jose. You know, we just bless my mind in Jesus' name to be established upon the word, washed by the washing of the word. Get regenerated and renewed, and thus my life be transformed. Hold your coin out. Lord, just thank you for promises that we can begin to use as tools to take us into new rooms and new places. Yeah, Lord, not only for our sakes only, but for our families, for those around us, for our culture, for our city. God, what would Warrensburg be like? God, if a few, if you could do it with 12, you lost one, 11, but Lord, if you could do it with 11 and build the early church on these 11 guys, later 12, Lord, if you could do that with rough and tough guys, smelly fishermen, cheating taxpayers, tax, uh, tax gatherers, Republicans and Republicans, or whatever, if you could do it, Lord, with all those guys, Lord, I think you could do it with us. We take this coin, Lord, and just say, just one more installment of the grand promise of your goodness to us and your Jehovah Jireh care for us. Lord, we intend to walk into that faith room, that room of abundance. Our mind gets our new orientation, new address is the room of abundance, living in heavenly places, That's my first default thinking is, I'm a heavenly being. I live from abundance, and I speak down into earthly situations. Thank you, Lord, for every installment you give to make me be an overcomer, yea, even a co-reigner. Amen.